Hello. This week the video is going to be, a, be about Isaiah chapter 17. There's a lot of good stuff in this chapter and um, I think it's pretty connected to where we are now in history. It seems to be and um, there's some good prophecy in here uh, that I think uh, people would appreciate hearing. So I encourage you to watch the video to uh, see what you think of it. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the video and what you think about the opinions being expressed in it about Isaiah chapter 17. I just um, said a prayer and asked for an idea for a video and this is the idea I got, Isaiah chapter 17. Um, so we'll see what this, how this goes. Now don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and help out the channel. Comment down below, let me know what you think about this video, about what's being said in it, what your opinions are on it. I could be wrong, but um, let me know what you think. Okay, I'm going to move fast on this one because I want to try to keep it short, but we have a lot of ground to cover. Okay, first we're going to just go quickly on the history here. Now, during the, the time of King David, the king, uh, his kingdom was took all of this, all of this, up into here, up into here. So he, he ran all of this. But later on, during the time after the time of his son Solomon, during his time, the kingdom was divided into two. To the kingdom of Israel in the north, and the kingdom of Judah in the south. Now the kingdom of Judah, they were more uh, law-keeping and law-abiding people. When the king of the north split off from, from Judah, he set up some golden calves. One up here somewhere in Dan, and one here in, in uh, Samaria or one in the south here and these two golden calves were to keep the people from going to Judah to Jerusalem and being uh, because the religious center was in Jerusalem and he wanted to draw them away from the religious center so that they would be separate kingdoms and so he set up these golden calves and um, one of the kings of uh, Israel in Samaria, named Ahab, he ma married the king of Tyre's daughter, who was named Jezebel. And they brought Baal worship into the kingdom also. And so this kingdom here was, they were pretty much idol worshippers. And they had gone very much to the way of the Canaanites. And it was kind of a mixture between the Canaanite religion and the religion of Israel. And it was uh, condemned by God very many times. The kingdom of Judah, they, they were being polluted by it also at times. But they kind of were a pendulum going back and forth. Uh, some kings would destroy all the idols and bring the the kingdom back under the rule of God's way, the way of Moses, and centered around Jerusalem. And then some kings would go with the idols again, and it kind of went back and forth. But up in the north part, Israel, that was pretty much idol worship through the whole time. <clears throat> so this kind of reminds me, I've been thinking a lot lately, about um, the parodies, you know, like prophecy is, is um, a parody of ancient history, the prophecy today. And I'm thinking about, okay, if, if you look at Christianity as like an Israel, like Jesus led us to the promised land. He led us across the Jordan River. The baptism is the Jordan River. So we start this Christian journey and... It had a great 
one one it came under one king in Christianity basically it was the Roman kingdom and then it split up right and then it split between the east and the west you could say so there's one split and then it split again it split between the western side split between Catholics and Protestants and in the East, I don't know a lot of the Eastern history. You have the um, the uh, Eastern Church, the, the more of the Russian Church, and then you have the the Syrian Church or things like that. I don't know a lot about that. Um, I study a lot of the history of the Roman Catholic and Protestant Church. So now you have like. If you think of it this way, okay, the Protestants are sort of more legalistic, more with the law of Moses, more uh, with the word of God, and they may swing back and forth sometimes. We're up here with the Orthodox, they're more, you know, with the golden calves and the, the mixture between what the world has to offer and what God has to offer. There, there's there's more of a tradition drives them more than the Word of God so if I think of it that way then that's sort of what I've been thinking the last week or two you know just thinking about how does history pair up with today and where are we headed what's happening where are we in prophecy and then I get this thing, and when I prayed about what to do my video about, I get this Isaiah chapter 17. And it kind of falls into what I've been thinking about quite a bit. So now let's get back to the history. So this is where we are at now with the divided kingdom. Here's the kingdom of Damascus. They're Aram, Arameans, right? Aramean kingdom. This is Ammon. Moab, these are the two uh, children of Lot. They are also uh, idol worshippers. There's the kingdom of Edom. So, um, and there's the Palestine, Philistines, which, which Palestine is named after. There's the Philistines. So, uh, so what happened was the Assyrian Empire Under Tiglath Pileser the third in the seventh century, he um, he conquered this area here, starting from Nineveh, and he conquered Babylon, and he also went down into here and conquered this whole area. See, Jerusalem is right about here, so he didn't get Jerusalem, but he got the northern kingdom. And he got Damascus and Ammon and Moab. Okay? So that's that was all conquered by the Assyrians, Tig, Tiglath Pileser III, in about 720 or 723 or something like that. So Tiglath Pileser, I suspect he came into Israel here and he ravaged through Israel. He, 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 didn't get the kingdom of Samaria that came just after him but he went in and down into here he probably took Moab and Ammon and he took Damascus and see the kingdom of Israel Ammon and Moab and Damascus were all banded together against the Assyrian Empire but under Hezekiah Judah did not band with them Judah kind of stayed out of it. So Assyria came down and punished these kingdoms. And these two were taken off into captivity. These, these guys were taken off into captivity. So this is what our prophecy kind of covers this time period. And this was what Isaiah was prophesying about at that time. But there's also a fulfillment of his prophecy for our time because history is like a cycle 
and it goes uh, bigger and bigger circles. So now we're on a worldwide global scale. Okay, let's get started here. Isaiah chapter 17, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aror are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which lie down, and none shall make them afraid. What makes that, what, what does that mean, forsaken? They will be left. They're just left. The people are taken away from and taken into captivity, and they're just left there empty. And the flocks of goats or sheep will just lie down and feed on the grass and not have any problems. It'll just be for the sheep. So where is our roar? Our roar is down in this area. This here is a river, Arnon, and our roar was a city in this area. And so the cities around our roar were taken. Next verse. The fortress also shall be ceased from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Aram. There was no Syria in those days. The remnant of Aram. And they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord. So the fortress of Ephraim, that's Samaria. Ephraim the kingdom of Israel was also known in prophecy it was called Ephraim because Ephraim was the the main tribe here that owned the capitals here and it was the most powerful tribe of this kingdom and it was the center of the kingdom it was kinda of like Washington DC you know like it ran the rest of it so that tribe uh, the name Ephraim came to mean this whole kingdom. So the stronghold of Ephraim is Samaria. And Aram, see these are Aramean, these tribes, these are like nomadic tribes in this area, in the desert. And this is the Aramean kingdom. And its capital city was Damascus. Aram. And they shall be like the glory of the children of Israel. All three of these. The fortress is gone from Ephraim. The kingdom is gone from Damascus. And the remnant of Aram. So Aram's going to suffer the same fate as the glory of the children of Israel. So what is that fate? And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin. Jacob is the man who was renamed Israel. So it's like when you say Jacob, it's like you're taking the name Israel back. You, you are who you were before I named you Israel. It's, it's sort of that, like saying that. Okay? You're not Israel, you're Jacob now. You're being you're you're being carnal. You're not being spiritual. So Jacob is the carnal side, Israel is the spiritual side. Okay? The glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. So that's the flesh of Israel, right? And so what's he talking about here? Well, the kingdom of Ephraim and the kingdom of Israel, uh, they were very rich. And they had plenty of everything. And they were extremely well off. And they just partied all the time. And they got lazy. It shall be as when the harvest man gathers the corn and reaps the ears with his arm. It's like... 
There's so little corn that he's carrying it in his arm. And it shall be as he that gathers ears in the valley of Rephaim. Now, I'm not going to look that up too much, but it's, it's like a valley that doesn't produce much, is what he's getting at, okay? Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it. So what's gleaning grapes? Well, when they did the harvest in those days of the grapes, they didn't harvest, they didn't go back over it and look for what they missed. That was left for the poor. So they would go through the harvest and pick the grapes, but they wouldn't go back over it. And the gleaning, that the gleaning grapes were left for the poor people to come and glean what was left after the harvest. So it's saying, okay, it'll be taken away, but gleaning grapes shall be left in it. As the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, Four or five in the outmost fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. So it's be like when you shake a tree and all the fruit falls, but there will be a little bit left here and there in the branches. And then at that day, a man shall look to his maker and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. Why? Because everything's been taken away. And he will not look to his altars, the work of his hands. He will not respect that which his fingers have made, his idols, his statues, his bells, his incense things, his fancy robes, or the groves, you know, the nice waterfalls with the green little area where they put the idol, or the images. They won't respect any of that. He will look to his maker. And in that day, his strong sh cities shall be a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel and there shall be desolation. So they're going to be thinned out, very, very thin. Because you have forgotten the God of your salvation and you have not been mindful of the rock of your strength. Therefore, you shall plant pleasant plants, and shall set it with strange slips. Okay, so what's that mean? Well, when they plant plants, the slip is like when you have the saplings and the, or the seedlings, the, the little uh, package that is around the roots to keep them good, those are the slips. It's like a it's like a sleeve, you know. When you put the you dig the hole and you put the sleeve into the ground, and that's how they plant the saplings and the small plants. So you will, because you have not you have forgotten God of your salvation, and have not been mindful of the rock. Right, God is the rock. Peter's not the rock. God is the rock. So you have forgotten your rock. Therefore you shall plant pleasant plants, but you shall do it wrong. You shall use slips that are not from God. Strange slips. And in that day, you will make your plant grow. And in the morning you will make your seed to flourish. It'll grow, it'll grow nicely. But the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and desperate sorrow. There won't be a harvest. Someone just hit my car.
I'm back. It was some crazy drug addict smashed my side mirror on my van. Uh, set off the alarm. Minor problem. Just have to get a new glass for the mirror. Didn't find him. He's gone. Ran away. So where were we? So there won't be a harvest, right? The harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and desperate sorrow. So you will not be what you were expecting. You planted your plant with your strange slips and you thought everything was going to be nice and you thought you'd have a nice big harvest, but you won't have a harvest. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the sea, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rush of many waters. They're all going together. They're all going in the same direction. They're all of one heart, right? They're all making a noise like the noise of the sea, and they're all rushing like a river, you know? all rushing together. They're all doing something together. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind. What's the um, chaff of the mountains? Well, in those days, and even today in, in poorer countries, when they harvest wheat or barley, the, 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 they harvest the husk and the wheat or the fruit of it is inside the husk, the seed of it. And they have to separate the seed from the husk. So what they do is they pile all the husks on the winnowing floor and they beat them and uh, they, that separates the husk from the seed. It breaks the husks open. And then they get a winnowing fork and they, they grab the pile and they throw it in the air. And the husk is light and the seed is heavy. So the seed falls down, but the husk will, will blow away in the wind. And that's how they separate the seed from the husk. So the part that blows away in the wind is the chaff. Okay, so they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind. So it's like the, the light part will be blown away, right? And like a rolling thing before the whirlwind, like a tumbleweed, you know, or like in a tornado, something rolling down the road. That's what they will be like. And behold, at evening trouble, and before the morning he is not. So there's trouble in the evening, and he's gone in the morning. This is the portion of, of them that spoil us, right? They took our heritage, they took the word of God, and this is, the, this is what they're going to get. And the lot of them that rob us. How do they rob us? How do they rob us? Well, they take the word of God and they give it to idols. They give it to falsehood. They give it to chaff. They give it to worthlessness. Right? Because they're using it for their own power or their own means or their own ends. And they, they, they become rich and they think that they're, they're successful. But the harvest is going to be desolation. So I'm not going to sit here and say who is who and what is what. On who's going to be chaff and who's going to be not. But... Um, you can pretty much guess the, the big part of it and say those who follow the Word of God and those who listen to the Word of God 
and then make God their rock and make God the one who decides what is right and what is wrong, those people are the ones being spoiled. And the other, other people who use the word of God for their own ends are the spoilers, right? And that what will happen to them is that evening they're going to have nice beautiful trees and their nice plants that they planted and they're going to think they have a harvest. But in the evening there will be trouble and before the morning they are gone. So that's what Isaiah chapter 17 is about. And it's just uh, the principle of how God works. He's going to let you plant your plants. He's going to let you have your, your, your good time in the sun. But at harvest time, you're going to reap what you sow. Okay, that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think of all of that. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And my van's fine. I was thinking that my windshield, the way that it sounded, I thought my, someone got my windshield or my side window. Um, but it was just the mirror. It was like the folding mirror. They smacked it into the van and broke the mirror. So that's not a big deal to fix. Okay, we'll see you next week.